there's life on this so when I you know sometimes I'll teach I like to teach series and this I don't know if this will be a series but let's go to Romans chapter 1 I want to show you some things especially in the uh, the time in which we live the uh, the shape of our society the um, the bend more and more towards a liberal mindset don't allow what you hear on the news sway you about the United States of America. If you're not careful, you'll think America is the government, that America is inside the beltway of Washington, D.C. That is not America. America is you, the people. And the tide of conservatism has come in to the shore, even though the waves of liberalism go in and out. More and more, I heard uh, Senator Harry Reid say the other day, this was a quote, people like the Tea Party are just anarchists. The Tea Party, anarchists. I've been to a Tea Party meeting. It's not an anarchist in the bunch. We're called constitutionalists, standing up for the document that if we betray, the nation's headed for doom. But we'll not, not, we'll not betray it. We'll hold tight to it. And I'm thinking, it shows you there, you can get a spirit of darkness on you. Uh, there are spirits of darkness, as I said, you don't have to turn there, but Ephesians talks about the rank and file of demonic activity that we deal with in this nation. You know what they are. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but you Bible scholars tell me what we do wrestle against. Principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, here on the earth, in the earth where men are, we deal with principalities, powers, and the rulers of the darkness. We don't deal much with wicked spirits in the heavenlies in high places. Personally, those things affect the things we deal with. So in that, we, we deal with them indirectly. Now, I'm no exorcist. But you know good and well, have you ever talked to people who they just talk to them and they just talk to your blue in the face and they don't get it? I mean, you can say ABC and it's like you're talking a foreign language. You've seen people like what you dealt with when you went to North Carolina. You were dealing with a spirit of darkness on your child and your, your grandchild. And you knew you were sent for the purpose of, well, I, I, that's the bottom line. Cast that devil out of that perfectly good child otherwise. Just a spirit of darkness trying to shroud the child's thinking. Shrouding. And if left unchecked, he builds a foothold, stronghold, until finally he's older. And then to try to get it out is harder than if you do it now. See? So it was worth your month's ab absence from here. And the fruit of the mission visit was very, very fruitful. And still seeing continual fruit from it. Let's, go, let's look at Romans chapter 1. And I'll show you. We'll talk a little bit about what, I'm, what I just mentioned. Thank you, Lord, for tonight's teaching. Thank you for the written word. We'll go by it. Not read more into it, but read it for exactly what it says. Not excuse it away. Not call it out of sync with today's times. No, we don't need to make the Bible bend toward our new way of thinking, more progressive way of thinking. This should affect our thinking in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul, the servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by the, Holy, by the prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, 
and declared to be the Son of God with power. Now you need to underline that part right there. Declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. I'd say the resurrection from the dead had a little power to it, don't you think? <laughs> by whom, or by Christ Jesus, we have received grace <clears throat> and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for His name, <clears throat> among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Every time Paul opens a letter, he says the same thing. Grace to you and peace. Peace. Grace to you. Enabling power to you. Peace. Anything that disrupts your peace is not the will of God because he's outlining it at the first of his address to us. Hmm. He says here, First I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of His Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request, if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. For I long to see you that I might impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end that you may be established. That is, that I may be comforted together with the mutual faith, both of you and me. Now, I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come to you, but was led or was hindered hither, hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you, even as among other Gentiles. See, the Romans were a Gentile church. This was not the Jews. I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as is in me also, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you that are in Rome. What, if, what would you have done if I'd written a letter to you two and said this? Look, since I'm, I'm debtor to the, to the uh, mentally deranged and, and I'm debtor to the, to the wild ones in the inner city, I'm obliged to come to y'all too. It sounds condescending, doesn't it? <laughs> for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. That's verse 18. Because that, that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. That which may be known of God. He's talking, he said, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. These are people who hold the truth in unrighteousness because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. God's already shown it to them. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are all without excuse. Because that when they knew not God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man, to birds, to four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. It says that God gave them up to that. Why did He give them up? Because it says here they were not thankful. Verse 12 said that because when they knew God, they knew these number of people never knew God. They glorified Him not as God. They weren't thankful. They became vain in their imaginations. The imagination that he's talking about here they became vain in is imagining themselves as God. See? 
and their foolish heart was darkened. Underline that word darkened. And just mentally refer back to Ephesians that talks about the rulers of the darkness of this world. Now that gives you a little understanding of what a ruler of the darkness does. His job is to blind and therefore darken the minds of his subject. Okay, now. Verse 25. They changed the truth of God into a lie. Be careful when you mess with the Word of God. You can't change the truth. And they worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. See, when they dishonored their own bodies between themselves, as verse 24 said, it said they, were, they were worshiping the creature, worshiping their physical body, worshiping the created, not the Creator. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. Somebody said, well, I love that person. Well, yes, but your love may be an affection that is vile. See? See what I'm talking about here? That, very clear. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly. What does that mean, in unseemly? Men with men. It doesn't seem like that would work. See, It's unseemly. And receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. Now that's what the King James says. Does anybody have an amplified? What, let me just give you my... 25. Yeah. Because they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator. Let's go, no, go, to, go to verse 27. And the men also turned from natural relations with this woman and were set ablaze, burning out, consumed with lust for one another, men committing shameful acts with men and suffering in their own bodies, and personalities the inevitable consequences and penalty of their wrongdoing and going astray which was their fitting retribution. All right, let's see what he's saying here. He said, they received in themselves the re re recompense of their error, which was meat. They, because of the, the total ungodliness of the act, you receive the, well, it should be of no surprise that your body takes on a disease that it would not normally take on if you weren't doing in such a vile affection. Now, this is New Testament, y'all. We're not talking, some have said to me, well, Sodom and Gomorrah is totally different than the same-sex marriage that we're talking about today because Sodom and Gomorrah was rape. That's what I, in fact, I had a girl came a few years ago. I, we were interviewed on TBN, Janie and I, and the, on a Tuesday. And uh, that night, that afternoon, a girl called and said, I saw you on TBN and one of my husband and I can come see you tomorrow. I said, sure. We're... Uh, have church tomorrow night at 7. She's, can we just come in for a little while and talk before service and we'll stay for service? Sure, fine. Came in, she and her husband. He was uh, kind of a loose cannon. And she was, uh, you could tell, she, she fit the bill. She had been a physical and, uh, uh, PE instructor. A lot of women that are bent towards that go towards that, the sports-like things. Not, I'm not saying all women in sports are homosexual. I'm just saying you could tell that she had that bend toward that spirit. But the two of them were married. And um, in time, I pastored them for several years. Uh, story had it that she, her dad left and left her mom in a lurch. And uh, they were real upset about it. She got totally upset with her dad. In time, her mom married, and uh, he was a good worker, worked hard, had a good business, ran heavy equipment, and uh, then one day, uh, he was lifting up the bucket on a front end loader, and the, he happened to pull on a line that just happened to be loose, and it lost the pressure, and that bucket came down and hit him in the chin, knocked his chin off, and he bled to death. They found out two weeks before that they had, he had let their life insurance lapse. Just an oversight. Left mom in a lurch again. 
and this daughter now seeing his, her mom in a lurch twice is more than she could take. And in about three weeks, she ran her husband off and moved in with a girl. Men don't take care of you. Men, well, her husband was a loose cannon, too. She was having to work and kind of pay everybody's bills. So men just weren't any good. That's her experience. She loved me, though. She came to me several times, and I wouldn't broach the issue with her. I was waiting on her to come to me with it. And she's the one that said to me, you know I'm with, and she named this girlfriend. I said, I know. And then she said, um, but it's not like Sodom and Gomorrah. That was rape. And I told her, I said, honey, just go read Romans chapter 1 and call me. So I wasn't ugly to her. You don't have to accept the act to be walk in love with people. In fact, the true walk of love speaks the truth in love. See, Just read Romans 1 and call me. She loved me. I loved her. I guess she read it. She never called. Never did. Verse 28, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, envy murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things. Look at this one, disobedient to parents. So this starts young. I mean, they're just a little bit disobedient. No, disobedience, children disobedient, disobeying their parents is extremely wicked. It's right in the middle of this list of terribly wicked things. Without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Act like chapter 2 is not even written there. Let's just keep on reading. Therefore. What's the next word? Therefore. What does therefore mean? It's a conjunction. Because of what was just recently read and said to you, here's the next part. You're inexcusable, O man, whosoever you are that judges, for wherein you, can, you judge another, you condemn yourself, because you that judge do the same things. I don't do these things. If you tell a white lie, you do these things, because James chapter 2 says that you can uh, do the whole law perfectly, but offend in one point, you're guilty of the whole thing, see? But we're sure of, we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. Now, you could keep on reading here. I'll, I'll cut it off. I won't continue reading. You read Romans 2 in conjunction with Romans 1 sometime, and look what he's saying. I don't have to judge them to judge the act. See, I'm not profiling the person. I'm condemning the act. The person is somebody for whom Jesus died and God sent to die for them and raise from the dead for them. That person, that person's spirit, I love. I'm not, I don't hate him. Therefore, I don't want to strike out against him and do like you hear some people, big old redneck boys that go into gay bars and find one they can beat the snot out of because they're oriented like that. No, no, that's no. They think they're doing God a service and they'll tell you we took care of his light work. No. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. It's not the person. And in reality, it's not even the act. Our job is to address the spirit and the way to address the Spirit is to preach the truth, speak the truth in love. And that pushes out the, the dark spirits. Speak the truth. Love the person. You've heard people say, love the sin, sinner, but hate the sin. Okay. Most people have trouble making a distinction between the two. Because the sin is married to the sinner, and so you can't, can't, redu re you can't rebuke one without the other. You can, though. Now, this comes up periodically, not just locally, but have other pastors call me to, because it's funny how 
I don't have to, I don't have to call somebody to ask them if the word's true. Do you? You know the word's true. But when you, when you try to reach out to a group of people and you reach out to them so to the point that you relax all of any moral code so that they'll feel comfortable to come in your church. See? And you don't say anything against the act so that the actor can come in and be free. How far do you take that? We had some, uh, and I'll show you this, this has been my experience, been quite some time, several, many years ago, I guess it's been 15 years ago now. We had a couple come in here, a couple of girls that were obviously a, a, an item. And they always slipped out right at the final amen and went on. They never did fellowship with anybody. They never would stay, never would spend time. They'd just come in, sit, and they'd leave. Well, one Sunday, I decided because they kept coming week after week, I was going to head them off of the pass, and I got somebody else to close out in prayer, and I slipped out the front door when they came out. This was at the other building over in Fairburn. When I saw them come out, I said, hey, I'm Pastor John. I said, I've seen y'all come in week after week, but I've never... Never had a chance to talk to you, and, but I just want you to know that, I don't know why I said this, I said, I, said, I just want you to know I, I, that I, I really love you guys, and I know the Lord wants to do some wonderful things for you. Well, tears filled up the wells of their eyes, both of them. I just looked at them, nodded, they said, okay, they thanked me, and they left. That's the only time I ever talked to them, that's all I ever got to say. Didn't condemn them. Didn't speak against what their lifestyle. Didn't ask them to give me details. Nothing. Were they welcome in? Sure. Absolutely. If the people that are in the darkness can't come to the house of light, where can they go? See? Now that's where you have to see that you gotta see this, see the distinction. Well, after they left, they wound up moving up north somewhere and with a job. And Church on the Word went through a, a thing where I, I let some things go that I didn't need to let go. I let a person rob a bunch of people of their tithe and rob a bunch of people of certain truths, and I didn't correct it soon enough, didn't stop it, didn't weed out the... the um, Alexander the coppersmith that did me much evil, as Paul said. And so the income of the church plummeted. I was just so amazed. I was more taken back by how one lying spirit can go through the church and people believe it. See? Well, there we were facing a, an interesting time for the first time, and I had already decided I'd pulled my finances to the side enough to where I didn't really just have to have much income at all to exist. Just I just a spray a mist in my face and that's all I needed. And uh, But we needed to pay the rent. And we're two days before rent's due and we're $1,800 short. When I went to the mailbox and there was a $2,000 check. Guess from who? They'd been gone over a year. They didn't know anything about us. I didn't send out newsletters. That was back before the days of Facebook, before the days of email. And I looked at that. It was enough to pay the tithe and take care of the rent. Interesting, isn't it? That happened more than once. We'd send them tapes, CDs. Well, tapes first and then CDs. Hadn't heard from them in a long, long time. But pray for them. Still love them. Still pray for them. It could be. Did you know that Rahab was a harlot? And when the two spies that were sent out, she hid them. And when those that came after the two spies were looking for them, she sent them another direction. She lied and told them they went another direction and sent the people that came after the spies in a different direction. The Bible says, by that act of faith, she became heir to the righteousness which is of faith. <laughs> a harlot can tell a lie and God translates it as righteousness because she protected God's people. Now, this is what I'm telling you. 
if a couple of girls that are living together that they know that they wanted they want the things of God but they still can't take get loose of this flesh and this soul tie but if they sent a church some money in a at a time of distress that they never knew anything about God probably orchestrated it to reach them and have something he could tie to them. We don't realize the power of finances, the power of, of the act of faith. I'm not saying you can buy your salvation. I'm saying that we are not smart enough to appraise the judgment of God. That's what I'm saying. Now, with that said, uh, again, I've had pastors call me. Well, listen, I got this situation we'll run by you. Uh, we've got some uh, uh, unisex kind of people wanting to come to church. What would you do? What do you think? What do you think I'd do? Well, I can't imagine you stopping them at the door. I said, no, I'm not. Not at all. They're welcome like anybody else. There's not a sin that's more vile and causes me to... There's never going to be somebody that does something either drug-wise, alcoholic-wise, perversion-wise, demon-wise, that's going to be so bad they can't come to this church. Now, it is perilous while I'm watching it, but it's very easy to deal with. Come to church, feed on the Word, worship God, mind your own business. Don't ask me to keep the nursery. I will say no. And they say, why not? Well, then I've never had them ask me, but if they did, I would just say, no. What about children's church? No. no. When your own life is out of order, it's hard to teach other people, especially the kids. What's the most important thing to you? <coughs> I can't think of anything more important than what, what my boys were growing up, and they are now and my grandkids. I'd lay down my life for anything. There's nothing I would withhold. And I'd protect them with everything within my arsenal. Everything. Then we had a situation a few years ago where um, we had some trouble with some extended family members. But here in the South, have you, anybody ever seen the movie Prince of Tides? It's an interesting movie. It depicted, in the book, it depicted the um, a southern mentality, and it happens, it's, pre it's prevalent here in the south. I'm going to close up telling you this. It's prevalent here in the south that says that if we don't talk about it, it didn't happen. If we just, we just treat things as normal, we don't bring it up, we just, it just didn't happen. It's a southern thing. We don't want anything to disrupt our southern gentility. It just didn't happen. And if anybody mentions it, they'll act like they don't know what you're talking about. What? Very common among southern bells. So we had this extended family member that had some problems in this area. And they loved my two boys and wanted my two boys to go spend the night with them at their house. And I told Janie, no. I said, you need me to tell you no? She said, no, I don't. I just need you to tell me how to bail myself out of this. <laughs> how do I tell this person? I said, here, you put the N first, the O after that, and say, no, oh, that's it right there. That's it. That's all you got to say. But you know it's harder than that. Yes, I do. I know it is. Then dummy me, I said, well, then just go, go over there with them and go spend the night with them over there. So she told her relative, and the, other, the relative said, let them go by their self. Why was it so important that my two oldest boys go over there in a place that where indiscretion took place? Why was that important? Because in this woman's southern mentality, if I can talk my grandchildren, I let it out the bag, to go over there, everybody will then know, well, she doesn't have a problem with the children. Obviously, all of our suspicions are unwarranted. So use my children as bargaining chips Use my children to lift any suspicion off the family because your pride is speaking more to you than the value of your own children. Ladies and gentlemen, 
This is why children get molested so much. 40% of little boys by the time they're 18 have been molested no less than once in America. Many several times. And it seems like the little boys are desired more than little girls. Now, what would do something like that? The person that says that demons don't live today will also question why people do stuff like that to kids. It's the very demon you don't believe exists that's driving the darkness over the mind and causing them to live totally by the lust of their flesh and not by So I've had it over and over again. It doesn't come up once a month. It doesn't even come up every year. But I tend to have rashes of it where I deal with it. And it has a darkness to it. It has a spirit on it because it causes you to want to go into a discretionary mode. Well, you know, this is not exactly like that other case. And I mean, this is in one way, this is not really all that bad. And this person would never really do anything. About it. All the, you go to try to reason it away. No, you cut it off. You cut the, like the axe through the tree and no. No, and don't make, me, don't make me raise my voice. No, no. Don't make me explain. You know why. You know why. What? You'll get that. Don't make me explain it because I can talk to you in terms that you'll think are so vile you'll wonder why it's coming out of the mouth of a preacher. No, do you need me to explain it to you in real terms? Do you need me to talk street for you to understand where I'm coming? I can get in the street. I don't want to, but I can. If you need that kind of clear talk. I don't d not love the person. Love the person. They need help. They need prayer. They need the Word of God. But it's going to take prayer and the Word of God and sometimes for years and maybe even then until they give their will back to God instead of not like to retain Him in their knowledge. You, it's hard to get that, peel that veil off of their mind. See? I'm waiting on one to come out of the closet saying, look, I fought this all my life in the closet, and now I'm coming out, I'm asking for help. I've never heard that yet. I've always heard, I've been in the closet, I've fought it, and I've lived a lie, now I'm going to live the truth. Yes, and Romans 1 says these are those that hold the truth in unrighteousness, rather than live the lie in righteousness. Live the lie, hold back. Live on the low from time to time. I've seen people that struggle. I know good Christ I know Christians now. This is the part that you deal with. I know Christians that have dealt with this. Dealt with their flesh. Fought their flesh. Yielded and repented. Yielded and repented. And go back and forth. And it's tormenting because they, they fight it and go have, seem to have seasons of victory and then suddenly they're back at it again. It's almost like the person is addicted to pornography or anything else. They have seasons of deliverance and they think they've got it beat when it just comes rushing back with a vengeance again. And so they finally just come out and say, okay, this is who I am. But it's not because of the way they were born. It's because maybe a spirit was assigned to them at birth. You remember the deliverance we saw on the night of the, when that spirit spoke out. He said, how long have you been there? From birth. See, this is why it does you good to pray over kids from the moment you find out you have conceived a man child. Oh, well. We're limited by time tonight, so we'll cut it off right there. Um, if it alienates me from everyone in my family, my job as pastor, as daddy, as husband, is to take care of my brood. And it doesn't matter if I send money to every mission field in the world and I'm, I've got a stake and a personal interest, financial and prayerfully and otherwise, over in the, the, the vast farmlands of the world. If I don't take care of my own little garden, what good is it? No. I'm taking care of my... If all I take care of is my little garden, that's the one for whom I have been given the closest and most responsible calling to, is my own. And I don't have to be ugly about it. I'm not going to be driven into strife over it. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to get into street. I can, but I'm not going to talk street. I'm just going to say, no, I love you. And if you need me to understand your lifestyle so much, and if you need me to have such understanding, then you yourself then by your own testimony are saying that you have the understanding that you need me to have. 
So I'm sure you understand my position like you want me to understand yours. You want to live like that? That's your business. I don't want it to be exposed to my children. I don't want them to even know that it's possible. That's where I'm at. See? I don't want their mind to ever be divergentized. From the, I don't need to know. I don't need to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and everything. It's not some things right now in my life I wish I didn't know. That I do know. Love y'all. Love you. I'll let you go. Amen.